Here's an idea. Why not open a coffee shop? Heck, why not open a chain of coffee shops? After all, how hard can it be? You buy coffee, that's cheap. You brew it, that's easy. And you watch the money roll in. With so many designer coffee shops, you'd think it was easy. That is, until you look behind the counter and start to work your way through the myriad rules and regulations that stand in the way of simply brewing coffee and then selling it. Fair trade coffee. Is that organic? Does it mean there's better coffee? Well, the answer is no, but it's a designation you have to be aware of. A designation that has virtually nothing to do with taste or organics. And when it comes to organic coffee, well, where do you get that from and why does it cost so much? Did you know that Brazil is the number one coffee producing country in the world? Did you know the best coffee is grown above the 1200 meter level on the warmer side of the mountain with three levels of canopy? Oh, and there has to be birds, not bugs, birds. Birds are good, bugs are bad. We invited John Neat of JJ Bean to join us for a conversation that matters about the amazingly complex world of owning, operating, and succeeding in the competitive world of coffee. Conversations That Matter is a partner program for the Center for Dialogue at Simon Fraser University. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. Welcome. Thank you. You run an interesting chain of uh, coffee shops here in Vancouver. And Toronto. And Toronto. But why'd you get into the coffee business in Vancouver? Isn't it like jam-packed with coffee shops anyways? And how difficult is it for you to like to fit into that environment? Yeah, those are pretty long questions. Uh, but the, the first one would be I was genetically uh, wired to be in the coffee business. Mm -hmm. My grandfather started roasting in Vancouver in the 20s, 1920s. He started his own roastery in the 40, 1945. And then in uh, 19... 79 my uh, and hadn't been working with my father at that point because kind of had a tenuous relationship he said look john do you want to join this or not because if you don't want to join i'm going to sell it mm -hmm. so i had a two-year deal to decide whether i wanted to be in the coffee business and at that point i was strictly in the wholesale business so i love coffee and i loved roasting coffee <clears throat> and bought a company that was doing some mostly retail and a little bit of wholesale but by then, Starbucks was starting to invade into Vancouver. And so you're coming into uh, an environment that is being populated by a juggernaut. Yeah, I started in 1996. So they'd already been at it for like 13 years. Mm -hmm. At that point, they had the two stores opposite corners on Robson and Thurlow, which everybody in the world talked about. How does somebody pay this kind of rent and be in these two corners? Mm -hmm. And just after I started, maybe a year after I started Cafe Artigiano, uh, was also so Cafe Artigiano and then of course there was there was blends there was second cup was in town at that point so there was a lot of coffee players so what possessed you then to step into the midst of all of that because you started with just one retail outlet I hate to lose I hated uh, people saying to me oh do you hear about Starbucks and my family had been roasting coffee in Vancouver for uh, almost 80 years at that point and all of a sudden we were being put aside, no longer being, we were the people supplying Umberto's and Bud, uh, all of Joe Fort, Bud Kanke's places like Joe Forte's. And so we were kind of the high-end coffee in Vancouver and we were kind of becoming dismissed. So got my back up <laughs> and I thought, you know, oh, what so can I do? that's a good reason to get into the, into the coffee bit, retail business. <laughs> Not a great way to start, but, um, it worked out and I had a tremendous amount of learning to do. Um, even today, people come in, you know, they get a, a severance check and they go, oh, I got 500 grand, I wanna buy, I'll open a coffee shop. And I'll, I'll tell them, look, give me $250,000, put the other $250,000 in the garbage and five years from now, I'll give you back your 250 because you put 500,000 into, into a coffee shop, you'll lose it all. 500,000, not enough. Not enough. Unless they have the experience to do what Starbucks does. They're like the Disneyland of coffee guys. Well, you were telling me once how long it takes for a barista to reach that level of expertise. And it was a real, like, eyebrow razor. Yeah, 10, 10 11 months to get someone up to level four in our stores. Why does it take 10 or 11 months to become 
Why? It sounds like you become an artist when you're a barista. So, for example, <clears throat> when you're making coffee in, in the handcrafted manner, you, you can't just say, I'm going to grind these beans, I'm going to set it at this dial, I'm going to pack it in this way, I'm going to put it in the machine and stop it at the right time. To understand what the right grinding method is for the age of the coffee, coffee has about 10 days from the time it's roasted to the time you shouldn't serve it. And each day that coffee changes in terms of its extraction because it's releasing CO2. When coffee's roasted, it releases CO2 for 10 days. In fact, if you put coffee in an airtight container in the first two days, it will blow that container up. That's why you see all coffee bags have a little hole in them. They have a one-way valve. It allows the CO2 to go out, but it doesn't allow the air to come back in. Mm. The same thing happens, though, is it's sitting in your grinding chamber, and the coffee is changing. So it, it's changing all the time. So a good barista has to know he has to change that dial by one notch. Okay, because wow. we want to see coffee come, and ultimately it's taste, but we have between 18 to 20 grams of coffee that goes into a shot, and we have an extraction rate between 20 and 24 seconds. And those, those things are determined by taste. So, teaching somebody how to taste the difference between a 20 second and a 24 second extraction with an 18 to 20 gram throw weight it's not an easy thing to do. With a lineup of people out the door. Exactly. <laughs> and that's just the first part, because only about 10% or less drink straight espresso. Then you have to teach them how to texturize milk. To, te to teach them point. how to foam milk so that it swirls in a particular way so it doesn't cause any bubbles. Then, once you teach them that, then you have to teach them how to pour latte art, which doesn't add anything to the to the taste of the coffee, but it's a, it's a standard that people have come to expect. It's an aesthetic that adds to the experience. Right. But you can't pour good latte art unless you can steam good milk. Just got to get you to hang on for a second while sure. we take a quick commercial break. Okay. We'll be right back. Sorry for the interruption, but I need your help. I'm asking you to support the show by becoming a patron. That means pledging $1 per show. Conversations is a unique program. There's no grandstanding, no arguing, no yelling. Instead, I sit down with people who have unique insights, specialized knowledge, and experiences that inform and enlighten. And we do this on an incredibly limited budget with a very small crew. Well, this is my office and it's where I edit the show. And then once it's ready, we give it away. You know, so many different websites around the world are carrying the show but they get it for free. They don't pay us. So I'm asking you to pledge $1 per show by going to patreon.com forward slash conversations that matter. Thanks. We want to keep producing conversations and with your help, we can. Now let's get back to the show. The people that I talk to who go to your coffee shops, they love your coffee and mm -hmm. they, they also appreciate your food. Yes. Uh, which I know is a whole other uh, <laughs> discussion. Yeah. But what I want to talk about uh, at this point is what is the environmental footprint of a coffee shop? Because we hear more and more, yes. we want to be sustainable, we want to pay attention to the environment that we live in. Mm -hmm. What are the issues that you have to deal with beyond paper cups and what you do with the coffee grind? Here in Vancouver, it's a, you know, because we have a very green mayor, uh, he's made it his thing about bike lanes and about recycling and, and all that kind of stuff, which we're fully in support of. Um, to, to start off the conversation though, what we do that's different than our competitors is that we default to a for here cup. So when people come into our store, they have to ask for it to go. Whereas most of our competitors, they hide the ceramic ware because they're trying to get people to go. So we have bigger locations, more seating, and we're trying to get people, we want you to have your next meeting there. But in saying that, we still have a giant footprint of what we're leaving in the garbage. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, up until recently, and we just made this decision to change, we had what's called a hold and go cup. It doesn't do anything for the environment. It's not a good thing. But it's the best coffee cup to drink out of. And for us, that's always been the source of our choices. What is the best for the consumer? Not necessarily what's best for the environment. 
Mm -hmm. uh, they don't go hand in hand very often. But we've made that tough choice and we're gonna be moving to um, a compostable cup, which will have a sleeve made from a recyclable craft. So we've done a number of things uh, that a lot of our customers don't realize. We switched all our coffee bags to bio tray, which are 70% uh, compostable. Um, and that's just in the regular garbage. And that's a more expensive product. We're just switching all of our till tapes to something that's BPA and PLA free, which the normal, you know, the thermal tape that you have in cash registers, that stuff is awful for the environment. It releases all sorts of gas. So we've switched to that, um, this compostable till tape, call it. We've moved to wooden stir sticks instead of plastic. Uh, we've gone to the plant resin plastic straws, which the, the city of Vancouver has dictated, has to happen by May of next year. We've, we did that a long time ago. We're switching all of our plastic cups to uh, vegetable resin plastic. What else are we doing? We're moving all our muffin bags from uh, white uh, bleached paper to unbleached recycled paper. Um, are there uses for coffee grinds uh, yeah. after having been been used? Because you must have a tremendous amount, and that at least you do have control over. We do. Mm -hmm. We don't have anyone. We have a number of our stores where people uh, want it for their gardens. So we will put buckets of it at the back door, and then they pick it up and bring the buckets back. Because it is a pretty good fertilizer. Fabulous. Yeah. Fabulous. We did have. Um, uh, some people use it for scrubs, scrubbing their skin. Yes. Coffee grinds are very, that, I've heard that they're very good for that. There. Yeah. Um, burlap sacks are another big problem. We, we, I don't know how many pounds a year, a uh, month. We're like 50 or 60,000 pounds a month of green coffee and a green coffee sack is burlap sack, 154 pounds in a bag of coffee. So we have 400, yeah, 400 burlap sacks to get rid of. Every month. Every month. So we've let all the local gardeners know. A lot of them like that for their gardening. They put burlap sacks around trees and in the wintertime. And, and uh, we have other people that are, uh, some of the farmers take them and they can put their potatoes in it and stuff. And um, So we're trying. We make it available. People will phone us up and say, um, hey, do you have any burlap sacks? And they go, how much? And we go, well, they're free, but you have to take 12. <laughs> it's not worth our trend. It's not worth our transaction to give you one. Yeah, the so twelve minimum. <laughs> yeah. yeah. One of the other things that uh, we have heard about, and I don't hear about it so often, is uh, the idea of buying ethical, ethically grown coffee beans. How do you ensure that you do that? What's the kind of relationship that you have with your growers? It's a, it could be a whole hour on that topic alone, but basically the most famous coffee that's considered ethically grown is fair trade coffee. Yep. Most consumers don't know what fair tra trade coffee means. They think that means the growers are paying their pickers a fair wage. But that's not what fair trade coffee is. That's not what the fair trade organization does. What they do is they say that there's a certain size farm, I believe it's two hectares maximum. If you have a farm that's two hectares, you can be a fair trade grower. Because their argument is that two hectares can be picked by the family. And you never not treat your family fairly, right? Okay, <laughs> your smile suggests that there's another story behind that. Right, so the thing is, is there's no way, the fair trade organization does not, the family can hire pickers. There's nothing that stops them from hiring pickers. The fact that they're able to pick their own coffee is not fact that they do. And especially people that are you know, teachers or social workers and they inherit their farm from their parents, do you think they're gonna give up their teaching and social worker to go pick coffee? I don't think so. So I have personally, I know this for a fact, talked to all sorts of farmers that say, look, this is the way it is, but if you want fair trade coffee, I'll get you fair trade coffee. The other problem, huge, and we were one of the biggest consumers of fair trade coffee when it first started. 
I had a, my issues are all, all mostly around quality, that's my thing. Uh, the environmental stuff, the ethical stuff, I'd like to say I'm a saint, I'm not. What I care about most is great tasting coffee because at the end of the day, that's what brings the consumer back. The other stuff is feel good stuff. Mm -hmm. And so when I first talked to fair trade people, I said, look, the, the coffee that I'm buying, it's awful. It tastes awful. So what are your restrictions? Because we know as a coffee grower that, or a coffee buyer and roaster, that the best coffees in the world are grown over 1,200 meters, okay? So if a coffee is not above 1,200 meters, you know, and ideally volcanic soil, ideally south side of the mountain, those kind of things are what we look at before we even get samples. Well, fair trade organization, the, oh, as I said earlier, the only thing is the size of the farm. Mm. They certify fair trade coffee at sea level. At sea level, Stu. That's a long way away. <laughs> it's a long way away from where good coffee is. Yeah. So their point of view is, we're basically a social agency. We don't, and I've heard them say this to me, we don't care about the quality of coffee. That's up to you. And I said, but it doesn't make sense because every other food product in the world is the best tasting product gets the most money with cheese, with wine. Like who would pay for, you know, Chateau Lafitte that goes for $1,600 a bottle if it wasn't grown from grapes that were super high quality, but they were fair trade, I'm not sure they'd do so well. So my argument is that fair trade needs to set the standard for a high quality so the consumer isn't fooled by the fact that they're just buying socially responsible coffee. The way that fair trade market works is if all prices for coffee is set by the New York C, the New York commodity market. So today it's actually quite low, it's in the dollar range, and normally it's hovering around $1.20, which is what the farmers need to make money. The fair trade pricing works at 20 cents above the 120 mark. Okay, so today, fair trade coffee would be at 140, and regular coffee would be at a dollar. So that's good for the farmers. We have no problem with that. <clears throat> What we guarantee our customers, every one of our customers, is that we will always pay over fair trade price to our farms. We pay, and then we pay most of our coffees are all over the $2 green price. Some, we have contracts for Brazil, which we're paying over 275, Guatemala uh, in the 325 range, and we put in three to four year contracts. So they have total guarantee that they'll always get coffee from us. Now, are those, the next question could be, are those coffees ethically grown? Mm -hmm. I have been to those farms, I have seen how those people treat their workers, and they do a good job. If I came to your organization, so farmers get quite offended by this, because they say you've got this North American ethnocentric, you know, thing that somehow we're bad people and you're good people. So, if it isn't fair trade coffee, then it must be unfair trade coffee because people are bad people that don't have fair trade coffee. But what about a farmer that has a farm bigger than a couple hectares? Is he all of a sudden this awful person because he doesn't qualify for fair trade coffee? No, it's absolutely no different than someone that is doing what you do today that might be good to their employees or might not be. And if someone said to you, I want to see what you do. Where's your fair trade? Where's your fair trade certifications, Stu? If I'm going to use your your services, show me your fair trades. We don't do that in Vancouver. We don't do that in North America. And yet, we take this ethnocentric behavior and say to these farmers in South America, Central America, what are you doing for your workers? Just asking you that question. Right. Well, I do know that you you care an awful lot about your own workforce because when your stores in Toronto were obliged by the change in minimum wage legislation there, but not in British Columbia, you applied the same raise 
yes, in, in both jurisdictions. Yes. Why was it important to you to do that? It's important because I don't want my, I didn't want my staff in Vancouver to feel second fiddle to Toronto. And it was the right thing to do. And I didn't want, I did raise prices in Toronto to help satisfy that minimum wage. And I didn't want two sets of prices. I wanted, and uh, the consumer supported it. The staff all knew that 100% of that price increase was going to them. And they were ecstatic about it. Many of them saw the math. You have convinced me that I do not want to get into the coffee business as you start off by saying, if you have $500,000, I'll hang on to half of it for you right now while you throw the other half out. I believe you. It is incredibly complex. But if you don't pay attention to every single one of those details and do them in a way that is ethically and environmentally as sound as possible, you can't survive. You can't survive because there's all those people, as you know, in your business, there's these very loud minority, you know, this, this five or 10% of these people that are going, how come your cups aren't compostable? How come you're using plastic straws? <laughs> like, what kind of person are you? You hate the world, you know? Um, and, or on the food side as well, um, they're all into our ingredients. Like, you're using white sugar? Um, they're, and so we have uh, gluten-free items, we have vegan items, we have like soy, almond milk, looking at getting to oat milk, for all the different people that have their different wants and needs, which I respect. But it is, makes it very complex to manage all these things so that even our milk, we don't use organic milk, but we have traceable milk. So that means it can be traced, the milk we have in our jugs can be traced back to a certain cow at a certain farm because we want to make sure that everything we're doing is as good as it can be. And uh, it's very fun. Like, you know, I'm a very uh, uh, particular type person. And so it's, it brings me great joy when all these things that we do please people. And I like to try to solve the problems with all of the, the peripheral people that aren't the mainstream. But so we've managed to attract them. And so what we don't do, uh, we don't have, we, we have a philosophy, and as I said earlier, but we've compromised this slightly, best taste wins. We want to provide the consumer with the best coffee in the world, and that changes every two months, okay? So it's a lot of work. But in our blends, three out of four of those blends are organic, okay? Organic really has impact on the world. To get organic certification, it's far more rigid than fair trade. And organic, what it does is they have to have several layers of canopy, like the short trees, the longer trees, and the bigger trees. Oh my gosh, this is such a complicated business. Thank you for sharing this. And truly, you have convinced me I don't want to get into that business. Okay. <laughs>